All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Crusan, the Communications Director at the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. If you paid attention to the agenda that went out with this webinar, uh, you'll notice I'm not Lucas with Minnesota Milk. Um, it's been a very busy day for uh, us at the state of Minnesota and for the dairy industry. We did announce the first detection in Minnesota this morning. Um, so there have been a lot of moving parts going on and uh, a lot of things happening with this detection in dairy. So I, with that, I really appreciate the presenters who were able to stick with us and uh, present with us today because it is a lot of great information that I think is going to be shared on the agenda for you today. We have two presenters and then a question and answer session. Uh, the first presenter will be Dr. Carol Cardona, a professor at the University of Minnesota, discussing the science behind this introduction and potential future for this disease. And then after Dr. Cardona, we will have Dr. Mark Lyons, who is the director of the Ruminant Health Center for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, talking about the national response picture and the overview of how the USDA has responded. If you do have any questions throughout the presentations, please either type those into the question and answer session of the Zoom webinar or hold those for asking during the Q&A session. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Cardona. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for, can we call you today's Lucas? Then I'll take it. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you a few slides. I'm just going to let you know that um, I will point out here some of the times where I use academic terms and uh, where the, 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 our friends from the USDA might disagree with me. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science behind the introduction, meaning the introduction of bovine influenza um, and the future of the disease and why we should care. So, um, so the first thing I'll say is that influenza or flu is a disease. A lot of times we talk about it like it's a virus, but actually it is a disease and it's caused by an influenza virus. There's four types of influenza viruses, A, B, C, and D. Influenza D you're probably very familiar with as cattle routinely get influenza D and you immunize for it. Bird flu or the influenza of birds is caused by influenza A, influenza A viruses. And they have some different characteristics. So this virus originated from birds, but it is no longer passing between birds. It's passing from cow to cow. Influenza viruses, especially influenza A viruses, will follow several rules. And we have to use those rules to control and understand uh, the disease that we're, that we're dealing with. Influenza A viruses can cause outbreaks and do cause outbreaks. The, uh, as opposed to influenza B, um, which tends to cause local spread, but not as much um, outbreak. Um, so influenza A viruses have a more explosive nature. The virus is fragile outside the host, except in moist and wet environments. In most hosts, most influenza A viruses cause self-limiting disease syndromes that can spread and spread and spread and thus cause ep epidemics. High path AI is a very big deal. And there are many hosts of influenza A viruses. So I'm going to talk about each of these specific things and how this particular outbreak or set of outbreaks are being manifest um, with these specific rules of flu. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why you and all of us should care about influenza A. So first, I mentioned that influenza A viruses can cause outbreaks because they spread. So the first thing I'm going to concept I'm going to introduce because I'm you know a teacher at heart so I have to give you some irrelevant information for you to mention at the next cocktail party, but R naught is a measure of transmissibility in a population. So on the right hand side of the screen you can see some classic human um, uh, epidemics. So SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 had an R naught of two to three. So that means that for every infected person shown here in black, 
that that infected person would infect two or potentially three additional people. And then those two or three people would infect another two and three. And that's how the outbreak would spread. So it's a spread dynamic. And that that dynamic is part and parcel of the the nature of the virus, the, the host species that it's spreading in, and how that species are housed or, or kept, right? And so um, if we look at um, H5 in chickens, we can see that in broiler chickens, the spread dynamic is between two and three for an R0. So very similar to COVID. In egg-laying chickens, so a older chickens, same species, but older and housed differently, we see a much higher R0, meaning that, you know, they're more in the range of Zika and measles. Um, and turkeys, which are highly susceptible to infection with high path AI viruses, we can see that there's much more rapid spread. Um, also, probably because they share drinkers uh, in their typical housing systems. So you can see that influenza A viruses, even when we're talking about the same strain of the virus among related species or even the same species can spread at different rates. And what's important about this is to understand that with influenza A viruses, we're really talking about an, a whole ecosystem that may be involved in an outbreak. And so a lot of different species. All right, so one of the reasons that influenza A viruses uh, spread so readily and cause outbreaks is because they change, they change frequently. So new viruses can be created when one host is infected with more than one flu virus. Uh, classic example here, um, so the flu virus has eight genetic segments shown in this red circle as white um, pieces and in the yellow circle shown as black pieces. And those two uh, viruses, in one case an H5N6, the other an H4N3, sort of shuffle together like two decks of cards, you know, when you're, you know, you play... Uh, you play a game where you're using more than one deck, then you get, you know, just this mixture of the two decks. And that's what can happen. And so these viruses, then the, the progeny that come out of that might have a different subtype or different license plate or different name. So H5N6 and H4N1 can come together and make an H5N1 virus. This is something that you may start to see with the H5N1 virus that is currently infecting cows, you may start to see N2s or N6s. That's an indication that those viruses may have reassorted, usually in a wild bird population where there are more than one type of virus. And from those reassortants, you can start to get different virus phenotypes. So different, those viruses could change their transmissibility, could change the tissues they affect, it can change uh, how rapidly uh, they spread through the host or how much disease they cause. The other way that influenza A viruses change is that every time they infect a new host, they change a little bit. And that's actually what we're starting to see with the bovine influenza viruses. There are now, I believe, uh, five clades of, of bovine influenza viruses because every time they've infected a new, um, a new cow, they change a little bit. And that's one of the, another way that gradually viruses can adapt and, and change and um, change their phenotypes. So for you, or for all of us, really, that means we're facing an unsteady target. New characteristics like different clinical syndromes or transmissibility may appear, and that makes it harder to know what we're really dealing with. Today, you know, we're really focused potentially more than we should be on lactating dairy cows because we know that they are heavily infected. But any of these changes as the virus mutates or reassorts can result in a different age group of cows being more affected than others. 
new sequences can make the detection tests that we have less effective. And so uh, sometimes you might go through a period of time where you say, I swear they have flu and the test comes back negative and pretty soon the lab will come back and say, ah, we've had a mutation and they'll come back and give you another test that say, say they are positive. So the more the virus is changing, the more difficult it makes everything. And then new and more types of hosts. Influenza A viruses like hosts uh, of a large variety. And so uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, the next rule of flu is that flu, the virus is fragile outside of a host. So viruses require a host to grow and replicate and influenza A viruses, when they are infectious, have an envelope on the outside. And that envelope is easily destroyed and can remain infectious, um, Not for <laughs> cannot remain infectious very long outside of a host if um, if they're exposed. And here's a, I, I went ahead and gathered the list of disinfectants that don't work on influenza A viruses. Okay, this is a joke because there are none that don't work. They all work. So when somebody tells you, oh, I got a great a disinfectant for influenza A virus, just say they all work. Okay, they do. The problem is, Influenza A viruses like to survive in materials that keep them wet, cool, and protect them from light, like fecal material. So that's where the disinfectant issue comes in. It's very difficult to get disinfectants to work in that in, in the environment in which flu viruses like to be. So they tend to exploit the weaknesses in farm systems to stick around. How many of you really look at the undercarriage on carts that you might wheel through the barns? Nobody wants to do that. All right. So influenza is a self-limiting self-limiting disease for some, right? So for poultry, we know that there are some high path AI syndromes that are not self-limiting diseases that are deadly and fatal um, disease syndromes. So for you, um, the human host, even though you feel pretty bad when you get the flu, you can recover and usually do. And cows appear to do that as well. So there's good evidence to show that cows appear to get well after uh, two uh, two weeks post um, peak syndrome, uh, po post peak clinical syndrome, and that at that point that they have they become zero positive. So antibodies are usually a marker of recovery. So seropositivity means that the animal ha has antibodies for a specific antigen. So in that, in this case, antibodies against the influenza A virus. And in general, antibodies have been a good marker for recovery. And from a poultry veterinarian's point of view, antibody positive animals have not really been in terribly infectious. So we and po the poultry world have been able to manage low pathogenicity avian influenza viruses by using this rule of flu, that antibody positive animals are not transmitting, effectively transmitting the virus. Now that doesn't mean that they are free of the virus. In fact, if you went in and tested, you could potentially find some virus um, using RT-PCR. But usually because in the whole population, they're surrounded by animals that are not susceptible, that that positive animal would not have anything uh, any susceptible host to transmit to. And so a population of antibody positive animals are considered non-infectious for poultry. Now, though that rule of flu really needs to be tested out because bovine producers tend to move in a different way than poultry are moved. So we need to understand, um, for example, how long those animals that are in, that are antibody positive might still be shedding or if they need to be isolated or if they need, you know, I don't know, have their feet dipped or whatever, whatever needs to happen. But though, but the rule of flu is generally that this is going to be a self-limiting disease. 
a group can recover and stop being infectious if it is closed and isolated again about two weeks and that's for poultry so it'll be interesting and and usually the dependent factor here is on how homogenous um, the infection is so in other words if everybody gets infected altogether then uh, the recovery can be faster if it takes a long time for the disease to originally spread through the herd then it usually takes longer and a longer period of isolation to get that generalized um, antibody positive status but one cow that will someday recover from influenza may be producing enough virus to kill about a million chickens every day. If she's producing 100 pounds of milk a day, we know that they're producing 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 virions per ml. That's enough virus to kill a million chickens every day. So this is the a situation where as I mentioned before, when we talked about poultry and r knots, we have different susceptibilities among different species, different outcomes for the same virus infection, but different species are going to react differently and it's going to, it, it becomes imperative that food animal producers work together to limit the impacts on each other. So high path AI is a big deal and really a different deal. So um, we've talked about, I mentioned, you know, this as potentially a low pathogenicity type of strategy, but this finding um, of bird flu in beef um, is very troubling. And the reason why. Now, this was detected um, by FSIS uh, inspectors, um, but it wasn't purposeful. The, the system of detection hasn't been purposefully examined for its ability to detect cattle that may asymptomatically have this virus. So that's why it remains a concern. Now, let's think about the science of this. So why is this a big deal? All right, so now you get a little bit of nerdy fluology here. So in our, in our flu virus over here, so we talked about the eight segments. This green segment here, segment four, produces the hemagglutinin, which is on the outside of the virion. This hemagglutinin is the HA0, okay? HA0 has to be cut into HA1 and HA2 to become and to replicate, to grow. And it has to replicate or grow to cause disease. So HA1 and HA2 are cleaved in the case of a low path virus by trypsin like enzymes that are found in the gut, in the respiratory tract and sometimes in the mature birds reproductive tract, okay? But this extended multi-basic amino acid cleavage site that is found in high path AI viruses is cleaved by proteases, which are ubiquitous in the host. And that's why high path AI viruses can go throughout, okay? And that means that every tissue in the virus could have virus, okay? Or every tissue in the host could have virus. So that's why trading partners get very excited about products coming from animals that have high path AI. Now, um, we had assumed, or I had assumed, um, thinking like a veterinarian, that this wasn't happening with cattle because they were able to recover. But this report has me very concerned, and I'm sure it has our our partners. Um, it has other people concerned as well. So I'm sitting, I'm standing by and waiting to learn more about those cases. But um, this is this is a big deal. Okay, next point of flu. There are many hosts of influenza A viruses. 
There are approximately 2,000 avian species in North America and about 1,000 mammalian species. We are never going to know how many of them are flu hosts. Never. So, and we are never going to know the pathogenesis and the, the ecology of those infections for the most part. But what we're seeing with this new strain is, of course, one new species that we didn't know before, which, which are cows. Um, and we're also seeing some additional new species like uh, alpacas and um, as well as some of the, the um, marine mammals. But these hosts apparently are simply based on um, exposure and opportunity in my mind. So sometimes we've talked about um, pigs being a mixing vessel. Humans are also a mixing vessel. Turkeys have been a mixing vessel. We know the genetic reservoirs are the wild and uh, aquatic hosts or wild birds. But that doesn't mean they're the only source of, of, of virus, right? So humans can remain a source of virus, as can pigs. And in my mind, I think cows will be there as well, remaining a host. We've also seen horses transmitting influenza viruses, avian influenza-like viruses to dogs. We've seen cats getting uh, avian influenza viruses, H5N1, H7N2, um, and then infecting humans. So these arrows, influenza A viruses, simply like a lot of hosts. Um, these hosts can be very troublesome because, you know, as food animal producers, people producing animals for consumption, the consumer can punish you when cute animals become infected. Just as ironic, it's the International Year of the Camelid and the first camelid we've ever seen infected with high path AI. Uh, this uh, information came out two days ago that house mice have tested positive in New Mexico. This is um, a big deal. Uh, previously, we thought that house mice were um, not able to replicate influenza viruses because they have a spe specific genetic um, mutation that prevents it. But this was this was quite shocking, meaning that our poultry friends may not be able to practice the same type of bio exclusion that they've relied on to have an economically sustainable product. So. This is where I have to say that I'm probably differing from my uh, USDA colleagues. Um, this is an academic definition of endemic. An infection is said to be endemic in a population when that infection is constantly present or maintained at a baseline level. And that's where I think we will be with bovine influenza and H5N1. I believe we are there already in the generic um, wild bird population, and I think we will be there with bovine. Now, endemic has a specific trade meaning, and uh, that that trade meanings means that we're not going to continue. We're not going to continue to try to eradicate, and um, we're going to operate under endemic rules. And we haven't gone there yet. So I'm saying this is an an academically endemic infection. And endemic diseases are managed with specific types of tools that I think uh, the bovine industry, um, it, one, is going after and will need as part of their control programs. One of those is going to be vaccination, and another is going to be quality control programs and biosecurity specific to this disease. So although we don't know what we, everything we want to know about bovine influenza, we know that it has to follow, follow the rules of influenza A viruses. And by using that, I think we can control this. I think there's a lot of hope. But now I have to ask you, why should you care about influenza A viruses? Well, one, self-preservation. So this is from the 1918 pandemic. Um, now, I don't think that that's going to happen again. 
We have vaccines and antivirals available. But this is a, a pandemic that killed two and a half percent of the human population. Um, more soldiers died from this influenza than died from combat in World War I. So this is a huge deal, right? And if anything, we really need to remember that human infections are a reality. Economics, um, I know that cows do recover, but they also get sick. Drenching, uh, supportive care is all part of this. There's loss of milk production. So I think economics are always going to be part of it. And then I think your legacy, you have to think about that. Uh, you know, I mentioned this with the alpacas, but we've got several charismatic species that are susceptible to influenza, including bald eagles, you know, and it doesn't take long for bald eagles to make consumers think twice about um, our animal products, unfortunately. And, you know, the poultry industry has been grouped in with milk um, because they think about milk and eggs together. And so the price of price of eggs is going up again and people are going to get angry at milk and eggs all over again. And it goes on and on and on. So H5 is everywhere, literally everywhere, except Australia, New Zealand. So we literally need to think about how we as a world are going to be combating this since we are all literally all facing the cha same challenge maybe we should work together some of the things i tell my poultry producers and i'll remind you don't kill what you're trying to save right you got to save the dairy industry because this is i mean this is what we're trying to save we need to save the poultry industry we all have to learn to live with this virus and be able to live together without infecting each other. Um, what do we have to do? What can be delayed? Those are the types of questions that have to be asked in order to come up with feasible control programs. Testing has to happen. And I think it's one of the difficulties that faces all food companies. Food animal systems need a better way to do this to avoid consumer and regulatory backlash. Now, you know, the people on this call who are from the USDA are good friends and, you know, would never purposefully um, uh, hurt animals, food animal systems. But in many ways, there's a reportability of, of you know, a, a a sensationalism that comes around when you're the first system or the first place to test positive. And I think we need to get around that somehow because uh, we can't go through this idea that nobody tests when there's going to be a pain point because sooner or later, this is going to be in pigs. Sooner or later, this is going to be in horses. Sooner or later, it's going to be in dogs. How are we going to deal with this whole reluctance when when we need to to get on and use those tools and not face the not face those difficulties um don't mistake monetary and political tactics for disease control strategies so i think it's important as an industry as a commodity keep your eye on your morals dollars and trade do not equal human lives and you know, here's where again I might differ with my USDA colleagues, but I think um, I would encourage everyone to keep your eyes on your morals, um, speak with your values, and finally, this can be solved using the rules of flu. We could reduce explosive outbreaks in cattle and prevent spread to poultry and other species. Um, it will be easier to end the more quickly we get started, and human lives can be protected with vaccines and antivirals. But will consumers forgive infections? So I think we're walking this line, and it's important for all consumers and all uh, food animal commodities to understand we're all in this together. So any questions for me? I don't know, Michael, if you want to take those at the end. There's my email down there if you want to send me, uh, you know, comments um, or questions or Tell me to be quiet. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cardona. And if you do have a question uh, for Dr. Cardona from her presentation, please drop that in the Q&A and we will address those during the Q&A section. 
Next up, we have Dr. Mark Lyons, Director of the Ruminant Health Center at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, to talk about that national response and overview. And then uh, after Dr. Lyons is done, we did get Lucas to join the meeting, and he will facilitate the Q&A session. So turning it over to you, Dr. Lyons. Yeah, thank you. And let me see if I can get my screen shared for presentation. Yep, looks like it's up. Okay, very good. So uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to kind of come and speak um, on this event. Um, my name is Mark Lyons. I am in my day job, the Ruminant Health Center uh, National Director. Um, right now with the incident, I'm currently operating as the National Incident Coordinator um, through kind of what this event is. So I'll just kind of start and kind of go through um, what our response has been, what we've kind of learned, and through that, um, I thought Dr. Cardona, I thought you did very well, and I don't think we're really as misaligned as, as you um, may, have, may have thought, but we'll kind of get through that. And then I want to really kind of uh, spend some time focusing on kind of the next steps and actions and kind of a um, call for everybody on this um, on this webinar to kind of like step into next steps with us. So um, just to kind of start, so, all right, there we go. Um, so just kind of provide an, an overarching summary. So on March 25th is uh, 2024. That's when we had our first confirmation of this um, event, really kind of the, the spillover of that HPAI um, H5N1 into the dairy cattle. Um, first kind of confirmed in Texas uh, dairy cattle herds um, in that panhandle space, had additional detections in geography with New Mexico as well as up into Kansas. Um, that's likely where this spillover event first happened. Um, again, being you know an initial uh, single-time introduction from wild birds into the dairy cattle systems. Um, that is the only known introduction. We've not really seen uh, additional introductions of this virus into dairy cattle related to uh, any uh, migratory birds spillover. So it truly was that kind of isolated event. And as of right now, and, and all this is on our website, we do have 84 uh, premises that have been confirmed in the nine states that are, are shown here on the map. Um, moving forward, just kind of summarize, again, just at a high level, some of the field activities we're going. Um, and this map kind of shows where those activities are really underway in the different states. But um, launching epidemi epidemiology questionnaires is very important for us. This is a new event. This is a new um, first-time spillover event in dairy cattle. So learning the epi, learning how that affects those cattle, learning kind of what's happening with the spread, that's all being captured in those epi questionnaires. And we um, very much appreciate the work that this, the producers and the states are giving us in that space to complete kind of this picture uh, for this event. Uh, we do have some on-farm intensive sampling that's being done, again, we, to learn more about this disease. Um, it is a voluntary participation, and, and I would highly recommend, again, those firms that are working with us in that space to learn more about this disease, moving through their herds and moving through those animals. We've also got um, wildlife and prairie domestic species sampling that's being done by our wildlife services counterparts within USDA. Um, those uh, teams are going out and they're actually collecting some of those additional samples. So the um, mice that were detected uh, that Dr. Cardona mentioned um, those were actually captured by wildlife services from a poultry premises um, where we had kind of had avian influenza. And then we've also got epidemiology strike teams out. Um, these strike teams are really geared at uh, going in and um, kind of being the boots on the ground epi, looking at kind of the information and kind of learning from what they're seeing in these farms to um, address um, disease moving forward. Um, Coming to this, I, I wanted to flag some of the things that we've learned. So in the clinical picture, I'll go into this in a little more detail. Again, these animals are initially presenting with decrease in milk production. We're seeing a drop in feed consumption. Those are really kind of the big signs that kind of trigger. We do have reports of abortion. We do have some reports of minor respiratory signs in some of these herds. Again, trying to complete additional epi information and better understand how this disease presents. And again, watch for any shifts or changes that may be occurring. I, I will say cattle generally recover with treatment. We have had some reports of animals that have died, whether it's directly as this or it's a secondary um, underlying pathology. So is it multifactorial that's caused some of those deaths? But again, building the net epi picture. Related to transmission, and this is really important. So we do see that high viral load in milk. And Dr. Cardona mentioned that too. But um, the opportunities for transmission then are very high when we have this raw or unpasteurized milk. Could be a potential source of, of spread. 
Um, the respiratory involvement, we do see some of that. It's not not really the most prominent clinical sign, so we do think there's more likelihood that this is being spread um, either through the milk or possibly um, intramammary. Like there's a lot of ongoing studies in that space. The infection in the alpacas, we did see that in uh, the main uh, uh, presenting clinical sign in that space was abortions. Um, this, the, these alpaca were on a poultry premises that had high path avian influenza. It did have the dairy genotype, so it was the dairy uh, virus kind of in those poultry, the, and that dairy virus got into the alpaca. Um, so again, a very high viral load kind of in that space. Um, and then uh, one, one other piece I'll kind of flag here, so poultry are very susceptible to small amounts of virus. So where we do see this virus, um, the dairy strain specifically popping up in different poultry flocks in different states, that may be early indications of um, virus really being present in, in that state or in that region that then poses that risk to um, those dairy birds and those, those things. And we do see that spillover from dairy to poultry and, and truly like it, it's ultimately being spread in a lot of the ways in that space through uh, likely human routes of transmission. So whether that's movements of people, equipment, vehicles, they're, they're, there's a common pathway that's likely causing um, some of this uh, transmission and spread between premises that's related to human movements and activities. Um, I'll touch on this briefly, this is from our FSIS and FDA colleagues, but we have uh, many studies that have confirmed pasteurized milk and dairy products are safe. Again, flagging that raw milk consumption does remain a risk for multiple diseases and multiple um, cases outside of just this HPAI event. Um, we've also had studies completed by FSIS to show meat safety related to um, the virus and being able to properly uh, cook uh, materials. And then just flagging from CDC colleagues, again, those cases in humans that we're seeing in some of these, um, specifically in these farm worker spaces that will, um, are again being monitored closely. Um, clinical picture, I'll, I'll move through this kind of quickly, but wanted to share a few different signs. So uh, the first graphic here just kind of shows um, the average of when those clinical signs really present and the different clinical signs um, that are being flagged there, kind of the average days to presentation. Um, we've also, again, this all, all this data is coming from the EPI survey. So that, again, we're building as, as we get more, but you can kind of see the frequency of clinical signs reported on the signs. So you'll see how it's kind of broken up in categories with the bars representing um, those birds reporting more of those signs. The uh, frequency of abnormal milk systems uh, symptoms specifically, we've got flagged there at the bottom, um, just to kind of show the thickened and clotted milk. Sometimes with the yellow discoloration is the main um, presentation of those milk systems. Um, I touched on the on the epi um, a little bit earlier, but just kind of moving through again, um, the high viral load in the milk, um, seeing it kind of move through the alpaca. And then I've got a, a graphic here that kind of really shows more of what I was talking about, about those impacts of um, where we're really seeing kind of some of that spread. So again, we've um, flagged here, uh, you can see the, the number of farms for each of the states kind of darkened in that um, blue color in the map. Um, and, and again, I, I didn't get this updated to have the two additional herds that were confirmed last night. Um, but going down into kind of these things, so 30% of the herds that became affected did receive cattle within 30 days prior to clinical signs. 54% of them um, moved the cattle using trucks or trailers that are shared with other farms. So again, that presenting as a disease risk of transmission. Um, and then 73% had frequent visitors who had contact with cattle from other, other places. So again, um, are, are humans really kind of a factor here at contributing to the spread? You can kind of see some of the other um, epi data that's being shared there. Um, so just to kind of summarize, so the spread of this disease is being linked to cattle movements um, with further local spread likely, you know, as a result of those uh, human interactions. Um, it's likely multifactorial. Again, you may have those direct cattle movements that contribute to spread, but then you also have those indirect transmission routes we were discussing. And ultimately, the biosecurity is the key factor to mitigate risk. Um, in, in, in one space, it, um, you have disease on your farm, biosecurity, keep it contained to your farm. That biocontainment is very important. Protect your neighbors, protect your industry, protect your um, uh, other industries and, and species related to the poultry. And then biosecurity, keep disease out. If you don't have disease on your farm, making sure you have the adequate biosecurity space to keep that disease out of your farm and, and keep your animals healthy.
Um, related to that, I, I will kind of flag. So the secure milk supply has a lot of very good resources related to biosecurity. Um, I'd highly recommend everybody to work on a biosecurity plan if you um, don't already have one. And I'll get into some of the um, APHIS response space. We'll talk about some of the opportunities that are available, but whether you're an affected herd or an unaffected herd, there are resources available financially from USDA to support the development of a biosecurity uh, plan for your uh, premises, for your farm, um, to really kind of protect you from uh, disease spread, not just for HPI, but it works across many other diseases to increase herd health. Related to the response, so I've got a couple slides here, just kind of go through the timeline. So um, again, we had those first detections in late March, uh, March 25th is when we had those first uh, confirm confirmations out of NBSL. Um, April 1st, we had the non lab activated. We had strike teams on the ground in Michigan as they started having their first cases um, there in, in early April. We built the Epi questionnaire and we had that launched in early April as well. That's continuing to be a, a huge source of information for us to understand um, what this looks like uh, moving forward and how it's moving through, through these uh, herds and how this disease um, is, is really presenting in these herds. Um, on April 18th, we did implement additional diagnostic support for testing on dairy premises. And then we did follow on April 29th, the federal order. Um, federal order is specific to pre-movement testing being required for lactating dairy cattle, again, to mitigate that risk of the uh, high viral load in the milk. Um, but again, high, highly recommending biosecurity across the board for all cattle movements, both onto and off of uh, farms related to uh, this disease spread. Um, getting into in, into May, uh, we did move forward. We were able to get things stood up to uh, be able to offer um, financial support options for dairy producers. Um, April 13th, we announced for affected herds, again, um, to protect their workers, to increase biosecurity, um, the inline samplers to increase uh, ability to test and treatment of waste milk is very important, again, for um, combating the spread of this disease then offering reimbursement support for uh, the veterinary care that these affected herds would go through. Um, then on uh, May 23rd, we are able to offer um, those other additional support options for dairy herds that do not have disease. So those unaffected herds have a, a abilities to um, get support mechanisms financially for biosecurity planning. So again, developing those biosecurity plans for your premises, as well as implementation. So if you would start setting up foot baths or washes, um, those systems are fall under that implementation would be eligible for reimbursement um, through the uh, financial support options being offered by USDA. We had also um, reimbursed costs for producers for the veterinary care and for the uh, shipping of samples um, coming in from her just to maintain their, um, uh, to address that premium of the testing requirement as well as develop a status. Um, we also announced on, on May 23rd, um, our intent, we're working with through the Farm Service Agency to stand up a program that would um, help affected producers who do experience uh, milk loss um, be able to uh, uh, reimburse for those lost uh, production systems. And then um, June 3rd, to uh, this week, we've initiated our voluntary HPI Dairy Herd st uh, Status Program. This is a pilot program, and I'll go through that in a little more detail, but this is kind of a um, first step, kind of more of that long-term um, management thinking to really kind of address and help uh, producers. Specifically um, with this program, we do want to um, ease that burden of that pre-movement testing. Um, we want to kind of know statuses of herds. We want the herds to know their own statuses, to be able to have that confidence in moving their animals and not spreading disease. We also want to be able to have that status so you know when you have um, disease present, you're able to um, you know that you're able to kind of commit and to, and to respond to that space. Um, through the herd status itself, uh, it result from three consecutive weeks of testing of the bulk tank or a similar representative sample to get that herd status. So again, we're moving away from the, for herds enrolled in this program, we would move away from the individual animal testing level, be able to um, establish that confidence in that um, representative sample level from the bulk tank and then be able to use that to move, um, move forward and kind of maintain that, that negative status. Um, we would have weekly testing and monitoring. Um, we would uh, maintain a monitored unaffected herd status um, provided all uh, sample results remain um, negative and we don't have any positives. Um, we do want to integrate those sample collections. So again, minimizing impacts to producers, kind of get this on a standard 
and having those samples go into the null laboratory. I'll show this slide, which kind of just highlights a few, the, the different categories that herds would move through. So if a herd is interested, they would be able to uh, reach out to their AVIC area of energy charge um, for Minnesota, Dr. Stefan Schepfauer. Um, it, it is wonderful in, in the AVIC capacity and has all of this information to be able to kind of help us um, get any interested producers in the state involved. We'd also ask that you reach out to the uh, state veterinarian if you're interested and we'll um, work closely between USDA and the state to really kind of get her enrolled in this program. Um, if they're interested, again, it's voluntary. And we are in the pilot phase to kind of um, work through any of, any of the unknowns with this. But as I mentioned, you would have three weeks of um, consecutive testing with negative results in that enrollment period. Those be, would be collected through um, either the bulk tank or a, a different representative sample for some of the larger dairy herds. We would then be able to use that information to um, status you as a monitored, unaffected herd. Once you're in that program, again, you no longer need to do the individual free movement testing on the animal level. We would just continue doing that weekly bulk tank uh, submission of samples and those negative results would keep you in that space. And then in the event, we would have a positive result. By being in the program, we have a, a clear protocol to really move through now as a monitor affected herd, what needs to happen at the herd level for you to regain that unaffected herd status. So again, we've continued on those weekly samplings from the bulk tank. We would want two weeks of negative results, as well as no additional clinical signs for two weeks to be able to move you back into that unaffected herd um, program status. A couple other things, and I touched on these briefly already, but just wanted to again flag, um, and these options would be available whether you're enrolled in the status program or not. But for affected herds, affected dairies, we do offer support, uh, financial support for PPE provisions, excuse me, for your workers and, and for yourselves on the farm. Um, and again, that would be a reimbursement space. So any PPE you would purchase, um, you'd be eligible for reimbursement through that. Again, uh, developing biosecurity plans, implementing those biosecurity plans, um, the sick cow milk disposal from these sites. So again, if, um, you know, getting, you know, pasteurizers on site to do that heat treatment um, to, you know, eliminate any risk with those uh, sick uh, milk and destroy that virus in that milk. Reimbursement for the veterinary costs and fees that would be associated with um, treatment for these uh, uh, animals on the affected dairies, and then covering the, the shipping costs for those influenza aid testing. And again, just contacting Dr. Uh, Chef Bauer uh, to become involved in this program. Um, unaffected dairies, similar kind of thing. So the USDA support if you're an unaffected dairy would ultimately be the assistance with the biosecurity planning and implementation. Um, reimbursement for the sample collection being uh, done on farm, as well as the shipping costs um, for that the, those samples be shipped to one of our null labs for testing. And again, working um, with Dr. Chef Bauer to get enrolled in these programs. And then I'll just kind of this is this is my last slide, and, and I want to make sure we have time for questions and answers. But just want to kind of show so next steps. Again, we're going to continue leveraging and encouraging states. Um, response actions, again, related to the status program as well. Uh, if, if we find an effective bird, just kind of management and, and really kind of working through those steps. Um, continuing collaboration with our state partners with FDA efforts um, in that space. Um, that status program, uh, like I mentioned, really getting it off the ground as we kind of work through the pilot phase. Um, and we, the support options that we have, but ultimately what we want to do is mitigate the risk of spillover. Um, into other dairy herds, into other industries. And again, I, I think this is where, uh, for Dr. Cardona, like really aligning the, we want to get ahead of this. We want to eliminate this as much as possible from these areas and from these industries. So um, really wanting to get a handle on what, what the situation is and, and move forward to get this uh, under control. So I will pause there. I will um, turn it back over and stop sharing slides. But I think the one message I will leave is Biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity across all industries while we get our hands around this and really move things forward. So I'll leave it with that message. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lyons, for joining us in Minnesota uh, to introduce myself. Uh, Lucas Schilstrom, Executive Director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. Uh, there we go. And, and I know I and we have a number of questions. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, you know, one thing I think is a uh, unique opportunity we have in Minnesota. We are probably the only state right now with a opportunity to have a state-run uh, biosecurity planner. And so you can reach out to Dr. David Winand 
Uh, I, I might be wrong on that. There could be other states, but I know we're one of the first states to have it. Uh, so reach out to not David Wine, not Dr. David Wine, but we can we can connect you. Anyone at the Board of Animal Health, Department of Agriculture, myself can connect you with uh, Mr. Wine. We did it on my farm. Uh, it took about an hour and a half to three hours, he thought, depending on the farm. Um, and uh, he, he just sits at a table with you, walks through it, and David uh, did a great job and had it to us a few days later. Obviously, as that list grows, it might not be uh, as quick and simple. So I would get on the list now. Uh, if it's something you're concerned about. But please uh, send those questions in. I think uh, my first question for Dr. Lyons will be on the on the pilot program, uh, anticipation start date, anticipation of uh, enrollment procedure, anticipation of just if someone's like, oh, it sounds like something I need to or want to get involved in, what do you anticipate in dates and how? Um, and, and just kind of talk about the rollout of what we see in a pilot and will it transition to permanent or permanent during disease, how does that play out in your mind? Yeah, excellent question. So as, as far as the pilot, if someone's interested to enroll today, like what we're open for enrollment across the board. The Some of the logistics questions that come into play and some of the things that we do need to work through in this space is gonna be related to um, working with the state and kind of identifying what the most appropriate logistics would be for that sample collection transfer to the null lab. So there's some of that work that needs to happen um, between, you know, the state vet as well as ABIC to kind of work through some of those logistics, but we would be open for um, anyone that's interested to start having those conversations with us to work through that system. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I think this one's for uh, Dr. Cornell and like myself, um, uh, we were both on other obligations, unfortunately, and not joining at the beginning. So uh, Dr. Cornell is our, our cattle veterinarian here at the state of Minnesota, so if she's able to join. Uh, my question for you, uh, Katie, would just be on, on changes. We are now a, um, an affected state, so to speak. If I'm, a, if I'm a dairy herd and my cattle aren't showing symptoms, and you know, obviously in that case, I have not tested, uh, is, has anything changed at this point? We realize diseases change and tracking changes and things may change, but as of today, June 6th at 12.55 p.m., has anything changed officially with exhibitions uh, you know, regulations, and, and we know there's recommendations, but has anything changed for me as a dairy farmer that I should know? I can't do this anymore. I can't do that anymore if I'm not testing positive or showing clinical symptoms. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the uh, only change which will be um, implemented in the coming weeks, which we will have to do a, you know, separate release and communication on is, is for lactating cattle that are conditions having a testing requirement there. Um, but otherwise, intrastate movements um, can continue as normal and, and non-clinical, you know, cattle can are, are moving as normal. Um, but that's uh, aside from the federal order and that changes to exhibitions. Um, and obviously, if there's, you know, uh, a test positive herd, you know, will be uh, quarantining certain animals on that site and, and limiting certain movements from that site and helping them get the assistance from USDA they need. Um, but uh, otherwise for, you know, for example, you know, uh, you know, your heart heard it's um, continuing as, as normal. Uh, and I really appreciate you leading by example and getting, uh, taking those additional steps um, to reflect on your on your biosecurity, I think that's that's really great. Well, uh, it was uh, it was uh, uh, an easy and great thing, thanks to Mr. Wine. And uh, a follow up on that. So just to be clear, uh, it cut out on my end. I don't know if it was for everyone else, but lactating cattle, as of what you know now, as of which day we'll need to begin testing for exhibitions. Um, is that is that set or forthcoming communication? Uh, forthcoming communication. Um, I will. Uh, I need to verify with with our state vet and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but uh, tentatively, uh, June seventeenth or so. But I want to put that out with a caveat that I I want to make sure to put out the official um, communication. Um, but there are you know kind of different testing options depending on people's situation and what's best, whether it be bulk tank or individual sampling. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, allowing enough time for 
um, the those samples to be processed, but then also for those, um, you know, to not allow too much time that an animal may become infected in that time, but enough time so that uh, people can have those those samples uh, in a quick turnaround um, prior to an event. I won't go into any more details on something that hasn't been published yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that creates many more questions, but but uh, look for something shortly on that. Yeah. Uh, I think the next two questions that I see will go to Dr. Lyons, and I think they're just good to answer live here. Um, during the pilot program, is all movement stops coming and going on a farm as they're establishing that herd status? Great question. And no, so during the pilot program, again, you'd still be able, eligible to do that free movement testing of the animals to have those movements occur um, under just the current federal board guidance. But once you've done those three weeks and have gone through the enrollment phase to the monitored unaffected herd status, you would just be doing that bulk tank milk sampling. So you would no longer need that individual. Thank you. Uh, next question Should we expect this to be a seasonal event, and Dr. Lyons or Dr. Cardona? But should we expect this to become a seasonal event like poultry producers have experienced? Will affected cattle have some immunity, total immunity after infection? So a couple, and again, this is unknown. So I'm going to tell you what we currently know. But one of the things with the seasonality that kind of occurs in the poultry space, the warmer temperatures will kind of burn out the virus. So the poultry industry always kind of looks forward to that you know, summer heat season to burn out any virus in the environment. The virus does well in surviving in milk, and it does well in surviving in the udders of affected cows. That's going to be where it can kind of hide out and remain kind of spreading. So I, I don't expect that same level of seasonality in that space. Um, that also creates the fear of, you know, it continues, it, you know, we, like doesn't continue to just kind of pose that ongoing threat. We don't necessarily know if affected cattle have full immunity. They do develop antibodies. In, in some cases, we've not even had it, the timeline to really show can a cow that was infected, you know, six months ago even, we've not got that far to say six months ago could have been infected, can it be reinfected? We've not even had six months to think about that. So lots of unknowns still in that space, but ideally this is where if we can get ahead and kind of burn it out, we would want to never give that cow a chance to become reinfected, if that makes sense. So if I can add to that, the the in the rules of flu, of course, uh, you know, how many poultry individual birds are infected with avian influenza in the United States? Very few, very, very few, because when they get infected with a low path or a high path virus, they are depopulated. They either are marketed or they are stamped out. So when we have had low path AI in an endemic situation in the United States with an H6N2 in California, and when we've seen it in um, in Asia, where it's allowed to go on year after year and there's not vaccination being used, then uh, what we see is a seasonality to it, just like we do with human influenza, which is also endemic. So the infection doesn't go away. The incidence goes down during the summer months, usually because animals or humans are spread out or you open, you know, have better ventilation or different ventilation, but the infections don't go away. And then you start to either move animals and gather them in a different way. And, you know, suddenly you, you'll see explosions um, that happen again as naive animals become infected. Thank you. We'll stick with you two uh, or, or whoever can. Um, milk disposal at fairs and exhibitions. And if milk's collected uh, from a fair exhibition, what uh, actually this might be a Dr. Cornell question. I apologize on the fly. What guidance is available for milk disposal at fairs and exhibitions? And what if milk collected from a fair slash exhibition test positive for influenza? Good question. Um, there's some guidance on milk disposal. Ooh, sorry, I was pulling up the question. Um, in our uh, exhibition recommendations document, that kind of outlines some best practices. Um, I or someone else can throw that in the chat. Um, and then also the, the Minnesota Department of uh, Agriculture, um, that's a little bit under, more under their uh, jurisdiction and their expertise. So they're a great resource for that. 
um, someone such as uh, David Wynand, uh, but obviously, you know, we're working together on all of this. And then if milk collected from a fair test positive for influenza, um, we would, you know, initiate a, a disease investigation to determine animals that were infected, animals that could have been um, exposed, and then, you know, do any um, additional follow-up testing uh, from there, depending, you know, on on the situation, um, you know, and, and determining the origin herds of, of positive animals and whatnot. So kind of how we would handle other, other disease investigations. Thank you. And, and uh, Michael just put that in the chat to everyone. So our, all the guidelines, uh, check that out. Uh, next question, cleaning and disinfection. I, I know the EPA has a list and the Board of Animal Health will be uh, sharing that. Uh, the question I got to from a dairy farmer was if calcium chloride, which we use for like dust protection on roads, is that an effective um, disinfectant? We use it for dust control on many gravel roads in Minnesota. So a dairy farmer asked me, is that um, at all disinfectant? I, I don't think it's on the EPA list as I'm looking, but just curious if that's something that's helpful at all. Dr. Cardona, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, yeah, so calcium chloride is um, lime, right? It works as a nice um, uh, desiccant. And so if it is, you know, desiccation will work to inactivate the flu virus. Again, the issue is not whether or not it will work, whether or not it will work in the setting that you're after. So uh, in my experience in working with Lyme is, you know, on horse farms is that it takes uh, the right application to get rid of it. So we know this virus is, can also be shed in urine. And so um, uh, in that situation where you may have a puddle you've got to apply it correctly in order to have it work. So it's got to actually work as a desiccant in order to have it work against the flu virus. Dr. Lyons, do you have any comment on that? No, I, I think that's well said. Thank you. Uh, for the question sent to me, for the uh, county fair type protocol, uh, if you had an on-site pasteurizer, we're assuming that would kill the virus. Are there other easy methods of pouring something into milk, and I apologize if this was covered already, but is there something you can pour into milk that would similarly uh, eliminate, desiccate the virus? Are you asking me? Anyone who's able to answer. Um, I, not that I know of that has been tested, um, you know, and I think that's the, the issue is that the methods that, um, are possible simply haven't been tested. Um, so I couldn't say from my perspective. Yeah, I, I would echo, I, I don't know that I can say from my perspective either. Next question, how are dairy animals, and this might be Dr. Cornell or Dr. Lyons, how are dairy animals moving between livestock auction sales and farms being handled? So they go to the auction, they're purchased by a farmer, they go to a farm. How is that being handled? Um, part of that determines, uh, Mark Lyons can definitely speak to um, interstate movements um, as, as from the, the federal order. Um, if they're a, you know, lactating dairy animal going interstate, um, they're going to require uh, testing in a CVI to go from a market to a farm. Um, in trust states, um, there isn't, uh, the requirement for, for testing or a movement document, uh, but in place we do have, you know, requirements for records for auction markets that we, we have all that information on the movement. So uh, in the event, you know, we need to trace based on a positive or suspect case that we can, that we can do that. Um, and always at markets, there's always an official veterinarian on site as was required by state regulations. So if they see any animals that had clinical signs that they were suspicious for an infectious disease uh, like H5N1, then they would, you know, collect samples, notify us depending depending on the signs, and uh, there is a process in in place for that. Does that answer does that answer the question? I think so. Uh, next question, I, I'll go to Dr. Lyons, and I'll come back to you, Dr. Cornell. Uh, 
assuming you have time, Dr. Lyons, thanks for sticking around. Um, the next question was on what's next? If, if the disease, if the virus continues to grow, uh, are we expecting USDA to implement more movement restrictions? Any, again, regulation re recommendations will likely continue to change no matter what. But um, if you saw things continue to heighten, is there a list of, well, this is the logical next step uh, or, or not? So our team's still building what that's going to look like. You know what I mean? Like, you know, what, what are the triggers? What are the escalations? What steps do we need to take? What we really want to try, and again, kind of going back to the status program, if we're able to get herds enrolled in the program, we start to know statuses, we're able to intervene early in, you know, finding these infections. Can we come up with strategies and space, again, related to these epi questionnaires that'll teach us how do we effectively eliminate it from those affected herds? more quickly, limit the spread, all of that space. So I think ultimately what we're wanting to do over the month of June is highlighting in the status program, messaging related to biosecurity. If, if you know farms can really up biosecurity, kind of burn this disease out, um, that's gonna kind of step one from the ground level. The status program helps us just kind of know what those statuses are in those different herds and able to have those early interventions to eliminate disease. And then again, those support mechanisms that we have in place, utilizing those to really um, offer those mechanisms to support producers in managing this disease and ideally working for elimination. Thank you. Uh, another question about the, the template of the biosecurity plan we can use for our fair. Um, uh, Dr. Cornel, maybe something you can answer, or I know we have um, in the chat, we've got exhibition recommendations, but as a, as a premise or potential premise, I would suspect, and someone correct me if you're wrong, you can reach out to uh, David Wynand, uh, or we can help you reach out to, to Mr. Wynand uh, to do a biosecurity plan for your fair as a, as a potential premise, just as well as uh, any farm. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, I would suspect you're, you're just as eligible, but the, otherwise the fact sheet is in the chat. And Dr. Cornel, as you're thinking about that, or if you wanna uh, add on to my answer. Uh, next question is about control and surveillance zones. Uh, we know in poultry there are surveillance or control zones around a, a infected or non-negative flock. Uh, will this be uh, similar or could it be similar with dairy cases? So I can start maybe and let others chime in, but from the federal side, we have not moved into that direction yet. That could be a direction we'd want to go uh, potentially, but that's not something that we've implemented at the federal level. There are some states, though, that have implemented those kind of control zones and area approaches. Um, but again, so just kind of piloting and seeing like what that could look like or how that would work. Um, sorry, I was just providing a, a resource in the chat. That's um, I haven't personally done it yet because um, it is a a pretty uh, thorough course, but it's um, it's a uh, a free course for animal disease outbreaks for livestock and events. So um, that could be a really great way to go above and beyond for preparing for any kind of uh, event at your event. Um, and then, sorry, what was... Uh... No, no problem. I, I think Dr. Okay. Williams covered it, but the question okay. about control zones and that... Oh, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, anything... Anything yep. within the state of Minnesota that would be different than what uh, he just answered on interstate, uh, interstate, excuse me, okay. there are no uh, control zones. It's something they could implement, but not something uh, yeah, I'll read correct. between the lines and say not high on the list right now, but states have done it and it certainly could be done. So for the yeah. state of Minnesota, uh, anything there in terms of now or later? Uh, correct. We at this time are not planning to implement control or surveillance zones and would be uh, only reporting at the county level. Um, we are looking at options for, you know, additional communications and ways to give resources for people that, you know, maybe are in, are in affected um, counties, but there's no uh, um, plans at this time to do uh, surveillance testing within any sort of radius. Yeah, unless to, thank you so much to all the panelists and especially uh, Dr. Lyons and Dr. Cardona for providing our program here today. Um, uh, we'll be signing off here shortly, but I, I think the three reminders for today is 
You can build the biosecurity plan. Uh, David Wyand uh, is a is a person on staff at the state of Minnesota who can come out and do this for you. He will drive to your farm or a convenient location and, and walk you through it. Um, second, I think the poultry industry would, in addition to testing, if you're seeing clinical signs, the poultry industry would really appreciate a, a heads up. If you've got uh, neighbors within some radius or some area you, you drive by, I think the poultry industry would just appreciate the heads up that you're looking at testing or, or, or seeing clinical signs. And third, I think keep the questions coming. As Minnesota Milk's concerned, I mean, this is new uh, the, in a regulation type environment. There's not always things we all agree with, certainly, and we have been asking questions and pushing back. So whether it's directly to the agencies you saw represented here on the screen or through someone like me or a trade association, please keep asking questions. Uh, every scenario is different and we're gonna try uh, collectively to keep doing this better. So I wanna thank those again who helped answer questions and thanks uh, to all of our agencies for working together as we communicate this forward. Other than that, we'll sign up. Oh, one more question came in. Oh, Dr. Cardona, how long does the virus live on surfaces? We'll answer that one and we'll sign off if you are still here. I am still here and I'm gonna suggest, I'm gonna refer you to our secure poultry supply site and, uh, or sorry, uh, secure broiler supply and the it's appendix one. Um, I'm going to put it into the chat and you can see all of the surfaces um, and what we know about how the virus survives. So hold on just a second. So the answer is it depends on the surface. It could live a long time in probably oh a wet, humid environment and maybe a little different on stainless steel. Correct. So... Boy, it's nicely loading. There it is. Okay. Okay. So okay. we're waiting for that answer. If you have one quick Q&A, I think it's time to thank you, Dr. Cardona. Uh, so if that's your question, grab that link right now. Otherwise, again, thank you so much for your attention to this and uh, your work on the issue, whether you're a farmer or um, someone who serves farmers, and have a fantastic day. Thank you.